Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. This is an episode recorded live in person at the Consumer Health Summit in Scottsdale. Today's cool fact of the day is that giant pandas eat bamboo like a wolf in vegan clothing. What does that mean? Well, pandas started out eating meat, then they evolved to strictly eating bamboo. And since they have the digestive system of a carnivore, they forage for about 14 hours a day and sleep pretty much the rest of the time, like I did when I was a raw vegan. Researchers, <laughs> researchers in China's Qing Ling Mountains wanted to see just how much protein those giant pandas were actually getting from their bamboo. So they fitted them with tracking collars and then sneakily collected their droppings for research, about 120 droppings from each panda a day, which also described me as a raw vegan. And detailed analysis of the dung discovered that the pandas digest the bamboo so efficiently, they're extracting about as much protein from it as a wolf gets from its carnivorous diet. There's really not a lot of protein in bamboo, the researchers noted. And they said, quote, that's why a panda spends a lot of time eating the bamboo. Now, when I was a raw vegan, I spent a huge amount of time, two or three hours a day, preparing food, which was super weird. And I had these special giant bowls to eat enough salad and I put huge amounts of fat and I was always hungry, but I did lose weight. And I caused some autoimmune harm and did some other bad things to my biology. And I've heard this over and over from, from people. So I'm like, Hey, you want to try a vegetarian diet? You can probably pull off bulletproof vegetarian, but if you want to try bulletproof vegan, if you're young, you're going to feel good for a couple of years. If you're old, you're going to feel good for a couple of months. <laughs> and then it's a slow decline. Uh, so now that I'm a farmer, now that I have pigs and sheep, and I've seen the effect of animals on regenerative agriculture, on soil health, on vegetable production, animals are necessary for human life. They're a part of the world around us, and I don't want to live in a world full of people and monoculture vegetable crops because it doesn't work. Now, if that was kind of dark, the guy who's our guest today is even darker. He's known as one of the most evil humans on earth. Okay, not really. <laughs> <laughs> he's a guy named Kyle Sees, and he's a New York Times bestselling author, a well-known comedian, and a transformational speaker who helps people release anxiety and fear on stage, which sounds weird, but this is the guy who's had two number one Comedy Central specials to his, to his credit, but he turned comedy into a way to help people release stuff. I did not know who Kyle was until last night. I sat next to him at dinner and we started talking. I'm like, this guy has an amazing brain where we can talk about humor and we can talk about how that turns into letting people really talk about what's going on. So you guys are going to learn a lot today from this interview because uh, Kyle can go from that sort of making fun of you in a not unkind, but not really kind way, but it's a way that gets underneath what's really going on. And I mean, I've seen people on stage cry and have these, these personal transformations through comedy, which is unusual and cool. And we're going to walk through how he does it. Kyle, welcome to the show, man. That's awesome. And it, it's fun to have the raw vegan opening because I also went raw vegan no, for six months. I did not know point. that. Yeah. <laughs> and well, and it was crazy because it did, my life changed more than anything then in a good way. But I also now don't credit it necessarily to the raw vegan as much as that I was evolving. In other words, recently I tried to go raw vegan and it didn't do anything. In fact, I got really tired. I felt like crap. But the first time I did it, I got to, I, I went 90 straight days raw vegan. Mm -hmm. And I had announced to my following as a way to leverage myself that I couldn't eat anything. I said, if I eat one cooked thing, I'll give away $10,000. Whoa. And so I went raw vegan for 90 days. And that became the change of my entire career of everything. So it's, I, I, you didn't even know I was raw vegan, but no. you saying that it's like, that was actually the pivot out of stand-up comedy and into my new life. But it it's not just because of the way I was eating. I believe it's because I was leaving my old story of eating the way I'd been eating before and creating a new pattern and a new habit where all the old things that I was were falling off and creating a new alignment. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, so when you fall in love with someone, you go on a date, mm -hmm. 
you really get excited sometimes if it goes well and you create all these things. This person's the one. This is amazing. How can that happen? And then three months later, you can totally not like them or feel that, wait, I, I thought you were the one. I've, right. What, well, maybe they're not the factor. Maybe the factor was you were evolving and getting away from the attachment to your old story of mm-hmm. the past relationship or nobody likes you or whatever. It's You were actually evolving forward. And I, the, I did go back to my old lover's butter and ribeyes. What, was that bad? No, oh, no, that's great. But <laughs> if you, <laughs> but if you, but yeah, but I did, I'm, I'm in a debate in my head on if I answer that comedically or, <laughs> or actually give you a coached answer. Um, but I find that every moment we have decisions to make that we can feel in our body. We can feel in our body. Yeah. Does this expand me or contract me? And I don't mean like a pros and cons list. I mean, you can feel in the first second. There's no one I've ever met in my life that I didn't feel was slightly vibrationally heavy, like the kind of that didn't become way heavy if I keep them in my life. So you're saying it's not a cognitive thing at all. Um, it's a, a visceral felt immediate knowing for me. That's what I believe. Like, like I can feel in my, like, you know how we have those two voices. There's a first voice that says there's a first voice we have that has these little inspired moments. Like what if we just went to Italy right now? Or what if I left this company or what if I asked that person out or, or started a band, you know, those first yeah. v- that, that feeling it feels expansive in your body and you can't see what'll happen because it's never happened. So your mind can't put any vision to it. It just is a feeling. And then we have the second voice. Whenever that first voice shows up, it's in your body. It mm-hmm. feels like up and expansive. And then there's the second voice that always shows up that, that that's more we're more addicted to that's really got a stupid reason, but it comes up with why you shouldn't. Right. So this first voice will show up, and I'm sure you had those moments like, what if we create Bulletproof? And this this second, yeah, but no one's going to want to, or that kind of thing. Yeah. So the first voice goes like, what if we left this company? And then the second voice comes in with these really stupid reasons. Like you'll die if you do. <laughs> right, yeah, or yeah, it'll be, you'll go broke, but sometimes it'll even come up with dumb reasons. Like if we do, we can't go to the Cheesecake Factory party next Thursday, you know? <laughs> And the first voice can't tell you this, but it's like, dude, if you'd learn to listen to me, you'll own all the Cheesecake Factories in a month. And the second voice is like, yeah, but they have those Thai lettuce wraps. <laughs> and if you've ever stayed in a relationship too long that you don't want to be in because you know that eventually the two of you are going to go camping, <laughs> you know what it's like? You're like, I hate this person, but we already bought the tent and we're going in a month. So I guess I'll hate him for the next month. And then hate him in the woods. I, I've done that earlier earlier in life where you, you stay dating somebody because you have something planned. Yeah. It's like, the, oh, I don't want to look dumb at this event and show up by myself, so we'll just be unhappy for another couple of weeks. Right. Yeah, okay, I, so I hear you. Ha- and how many people do we know in the world out there and probably all, so many of us and probably there's other areas where I am still and people listen to the podcast that are in a situation they don't want to be in but they're still in it. Like, I hate this job. I've been here too long. And then the yeah, but comes in. Well, I've been here so long, so I should keep being there or I'm, I'm going to get promoted soon. It's the sunk cost fallacy where you say, oh, I've, I've put so much into this. I have to keep putting more in. Yeah. Even though the return on that is not very good. Right. So I have a rule that if I justify why I'm keeping something in my life, that I'm supposed to let go of it. Because everything in my life that I truly want, I never would justify it. Like I have a 21 month old daughter and I'm never like, well, she gets good medical, <laughs> you know, or, or like, you know, I love what I do for a living. I'm not like, well, it, it does this and that. That's you explaining it to yourself of why you're ignoring your body of why. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Your body can feel I don't this doesn't align in my life, but but at least that person was nice to me that one time. So I'll keep letting them treat me like shit now. Or it, it seems like you have spent an unusual amount of time looking at your inner dialogue, yes. like way more than normal people. That's the, that's honestly the only thing I work on. And then the business and the jokes and the comedy and the career all are a byproduct of the channel that I'm on internally. So I believe that if I'm not working on me and then I change the external the, the me that's here uh, won't be able to match the external that I make and it'll still fall. So, okay. so for instance, let's say you're someone who thinks who I am. Okay, we all have this. Who I am is someone who makes $20,000 a year. Okay, 
that's who I am. That's not what I have or what I've done. That's my identity, right? And we all mm-hmm. have that. I, I have this anxiety. I'm this achiever. I'm this victim, right? I'm this relationship. Well, if someone offers you a million dollars, that's death to the story of who you are. So you're going to sabotage it. Right. So there's people that have in their body that their value is very low or it's in their nervous system. Like, I got love for being broke in my childhood. Yeah, it's not conscious. Right. So then you force yourself to try to make a ton of money, but the inside goes, this is not in alignment with the soul of what I am. So Mm -hmm. we actually sabotage the abundance that we've just created because it would be death to the story of what we think we are. Okay. So a huge shift for me started when I started meditating and listening to silence for two hours a day for four years and transcending all of those who I am's and getting much more to, even though it sounds airy fairy, getting much more to understanding that I'm just this moment. This moment can receive much bigger than all of those stories. I don't know if that's making sense, but. It, it makes sense. My experience is that the people who have the most screwed up childhoods end up being either psychologists, psychiatrists, or comedians. Sure. Right. And, and you sound like you're some unusual mix of those. Yeah. Although clearly not licensed in any of that stuff. So did someone drop you on your head or something? <laughs> like, 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 why did you, why are you this way? Because most people just don't obsess about their inner dialogue the way you do. Uh, yeah. Frankly, I have until I erased most of my inner dialogue. I would say instead of like, it's, it's not that I'm obsessing over it. It's that you're I'm, aware of it. I'm seeing something. It's, yeah. it's a matrix kind of thing. It's yeah. like, there's like a, this, all of the things we stress about. They're not real. They're not real. Yeah. And I find that one illusion that every human is in is the illusion of when something happens, I'll be happy. I used right. to be in that big time. That, yeah, that is totally not true. Right. Yeah. Because you can actually make it happen. You're like, oh, I have, for me, it was, I have $6 million. I'm 26 years old. I'll be happy when I have 10. But I, it, I, learning that, I'm like, money didn't make me happy. I was in Entrepreneur Magazine at 23. And I'm like, oh, fame will make me happy back then. So I, I'm in this thing as like the first, the first thing ever sold over the internet. I was a caffeine t-shirt. And after that, I'm like, you know what? This fame, whatever, being in a magazine when you're 23 feels like fame. It didn't move the needle at all. And, and it was really disappointing. I'm like, okay, so fame and money, stupid. All right, they're both useful, but not happy generating. And actually, it made me feel really sad because I'm like, wow, I thought I was going to be happy. Now I'm not. <laughs> you have to, to do something else. Okay, so you went through a similar path, it sounds like. Because at 12, you were doing stand-up comedy. Well, I was so I would say, actually, my screwed up dark moment yeah. was more at the end, near the end of my comedy career that okay. got me so, like, I think that when we have these breakthroughs, oh, and it was, just as one finish on the when something happens, I'll be happy thing, the shift that I went through was the revelation is it's not when something happens, I'll be happy. I mean, everyone, we all know what it feels like to constantly think when I get that job, when I get the woman, when I get the the guy, when I get the the career, the money, when I get over this addiction, when I get in the moment even is a lie, right? Because you mm-hmm. you are the moment. So the shift I had was going from that to when I'm happy, things will happen. And what I mean by happy is okay with all of my emotions, okay with my sadness, like actually sitting there feeling totally depressed and going, I love feeling this way and being in it because it's a passing phase, but it's a deepening phase if you let it. And so I had a major incident happen at the end Mm -hmm. of my comedy career that I'll tell you about. My childhood was not too bad. It was pretty fun, actually. And I grew up in a family who we had entertainers. Uh, my, my dad's uncle was the prop man for Gallagher. Mm-hmm. Um, his, his mom, my grandma, was on the Carol Burnett show. She was oh, a wow. famous puppeteer. Because this runs in your family, right? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely something I was... It was a world I was born into as... Uh, it, more than just the genetic, genetic side... It was a world that I was born into as possible. Like it was just normal to see like my dad build company after company out of thin air. Um, and I had another uncle that's a jazz musician and and he's awesome. And so we just saw okay. entertainment as normal. And so as a child, um, I have a similar story to Jim Carrey, but in second grade, I took told my teacher that I'd be good if she let me have five minutes at the end of the week to do stand up for the class. Wow. Yeah, Cause I was goofing off and she's like, I was being funny and she's like, you're interrupting the class. I go, well, can we, can I do it at like a scheduled thing? And she's yeah. <laughs> and then at the end of the week, 
I did five minutes and I did Gallagher's material, which is funny because if you don't know who he is, he's an old Southern comic that was like a carrot top of the 80s. <laughs> so I'm talking about sex and taxes with a Southern accent to... In, in what grade? Second grade. I didn't, <laughs> And I didn't get the jokes. And you didn't know what they were. <laughs> I could hear patterns of how things sounded. Like I, I knew the beats of Gallagher and the delivery, but I didn't get anything. Like, <laughs> And I would just repeat it as if they'll get it. Like I'd be like, women, you go out shopping, you buy us underwear that fits cardboard. Am I right, guys? And I'm like holding up my dad's underwear to second graders <laughs> and, and, and doing sex jokes and talking about taxes. And and so every Your teacher year... teacher just lost it. Right. <laughs> They, the teachers were loving it, and, but also like trying to, and also I'm not knowing what's wrong, you know? If, if, if you're a healthy, normal second grader, you don't know anything about sex. Right. You're not supposed to know then. Right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But so you didn't know the context of it. Okay. That, that's fascinating. Right. I didn't know it was weird or bad. So then third grade, fourth grade, I was renegotiating with teachers. I'll do stand up if I can, you know, if, can I do a set all every once in a while? And then, you know, at 12, I was starting to do open mics at comedy clubs. And around 15, I was really starting to work um, doing corporates and and things and having these little kind of creative ways. You know, I don't think that our nerves are necessarily as much something that we have when we're kids. We actually learn why we should be nervous on stage. Like kids wouldn't have stage fright as much as an adult. So I got to be I got to be so young that I was oblivious to stage fright and oblivious to working through my emotions. And basically I learned how to be a comedian before I learned how to be a person. So I would go on stage and saw that as normal. I mean, and thought, you know, who you are is how good your set is. And, and I didn't know about human emotions and working through things. And my comedy career as a kid went really well. And at 18, I was a headliner. 19, I booked the movie 10 Things I Hate About You. Right. And at 20, I did the movie Not Another Teen Movie. And then I spent my entire 20s doing over a thousand colleges and um, headlining all the comedy clubs and had a crazy, amazing career. And I still was just in the showbiz side of it and not really learning too much about emotion. I didn't need to because every night I go on stage and get on a high and not ever ha- were you like dumping your emotions on stage sort of thing are you like was it a release for you I or a flow state thing it's like- more it was more like a high like imagine if every night you could throw a party and everyone loves you and you're getting paid a lot so it was an ego thing for you i mean without knowing it then okay you know when you're in your 20s i think you still yeah. we don't know who we are you're still in a lot of ego yeah yeah and so i would just constantly go perform and basically i'd get enough external love mm-hmm. that i wouldn't have to do any inner work uh, right like i wouldn't, wouldn't have to hit lows and you could go through a breakup but immediately i'm on stage that night you know so i'm not feeling i'm actually talking about the breakup on stage and then getting love that way and you know getting a lot of approval that matched the approval i was hoping to get from mom and on the stage okay that was putting it right out there okay. right yeah and so i think that it constantly put me in a high that was big enough that made me not have any reason to grow internally because i could just go on stage and and there were so many sets that eventually i would be able to do a set in my sleep and have a a really good reaction when you say do a set last night at dinner when we were just sitting chatting and i was getting to know you and going man i should interview this guy uh you you talked about how you hadn't prepped at all for what you were going to say on stage last night at this event and, and how you just go up there and you just allow it to flow yeah but when you talk about doing a set, did you used to, you know, prep and, and make up your jokes? And I mean, I, I've seen some of what Seinfeld does. Yeah. And I, I once played poker with Larry David, didn't get to ask him. Uh, <laughs> but like, uh, from what I read, these guys really seriously yeah, I am, prep for days and all that. You, you, you do none of that. I'm the opposite of how Jerry Seinfeld created his act. Like okay. I'm I'm more like as far as preparations concerned on the Robin Williams kind okay. of riffing way. Um, but I still would have a file of jokes available okay but i would be much more on the improv side so there's a lot of videos of me with hecklers online there's a lot of in the moment Mm -hmm. old stand-up videos that basically i would go on stage and you know i was doing maybe 200 to 250 nights a year and i would go on stage and just do a show It, it was so easy but it was also like um, I would be in the moment and then I would have this file of jokes available, but also have this very loose context that I could riff in and then pull whichever joke fit and okay. then kind of string them together. But at one point I did like 200 colleges in a row 
And I would just literally take two, three flights a day and get to the next gig. Wow. And was in this oblivious giddiness of, of a high that I wasn't sleeping or taking care of myself and just thinking, oh, I must be invincible. And then ended up getting pneumonia at the end of the tour. Uh, almost died. I was hospitalized. It, it's really common. By the end of a tour, I, I've worked with a substantial number of, of big rock bands and all, and they're all just wrecked. And I imagine yeah. with comedy, it's even more brutal because there isn't all the setup of gear as much. Yeah. So, ugh. yeah, it was it was crazy. And then that would be like it's like the way that I would finally hit a low was when it was like all of it coming at the same time. Like it was just like you're perfect. You're perfect. You're perfect. Your show's great. Everyone loves you. You're doing awesome. I feel this is great. Dead. Like it wasn't oh, like okay. I feel a little tired. There was no yeah, pneumonia will take you down. Yeah. It was so bad. It was so bad. I couldn't, I was on Vegas and I couldn't even fly home. I had to stay in the hotel and, and just, it was, it was a crazy time. It was, that was 2004. And one of the things that happened was the first shift of my life was when I went into kind of an achievement phase out of this kind of story phase. So, um, in 2005, I would go on stage and do my act in my sleep uh, and basically just perform and not be creating new stuff. And I, I believe if you're not continually creating, your mind will creatively sabotage you. So I ended up on stage one night performing and created, started creating anxiety-based thoughts. I thought to myself, I wonder if you could think about it enough if you could make yourself faint. And then my mind wow. started thinking about it more and more and more. And uh, I started creating an anxiety that was so big that it became... A, a stage fright after 15 years of being a comic i suddenly had this crazy stage fright i had this exhaustion and all this different stuff and that stage fright led to the world fright like i was actually scared to walk in public i was scared to you got like agoraphobia and i think the reason that i didn't understand till now was that i was worried that this will ruin my career and i'm under the illusion that who i am is my career. Well, that's a really common thing. It seems like it comes around 30 to 35. Yeah, people. for me, it was like 25, 26. Okay. It may be moving younger. Uh, yeah. Like that wouldn't surprise me. You get the, I'm a gig economy, I don't care about my career, which is the same as caring too much about your career. Like if you don't yeah. care at all or you care too much, it's the same thing. Right. Like if, if you're in the middle of the coin, you're good. If you're on one side, either side, you're pretty much. Because what, what if I had, what if I had, this anxiety and started thinking to myself, like now with what I know now, I would have looked at it and if I was working with someone who had that anxiety right now, I would have them accept it because one of the biggest causes of anxiety is trying to get out of anxiety. So anxiety is when our mind is spinning and it's doing all the stuff and we're trying to fix it because we don't like how we feel, which is more anxiety. It's more resistance to what is. And anxiety exists in the mind. Mm -hmm. But if you connect to a space that's deeper than it, this sounds corny, but it's real. If you connect to your heart, like actually feel it beating, then the mind can keep rolling and the heart is just the space that's looking at it. And then eventually it's going to stop because it's not being fed. Okay. So the first thing that I went through was a Tony Robbins phase mm -hmm. where I learned how to get out of it. I learned how to focus on what I do want. And I went from suicidal stage fright anxiety to number one Comedy Central special in 2006. Then this is what actually the big shift was in my life. So I started getting excited about teaching aspiring comics mm -hmm. that they could do this. I had this part of me that became this Tony Robbins in the comedy scene and wanting to show other comedians that they could do it. What I forgot about was that comedians are very cynical. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and if they're not necessarily seeing what you're doing, they're giving reviews of it and talking about it. And I partnered with a comedian, Louis Anderson, and we created this thing where we were teaching aspiring comics how to do stand-up. And I'm hearing through the grapevine that other comics who were friends of mine, you know, were talking crap about me, like Kyle's become this crazy cult leader kind of thing. And it hurt. And there was an egoic part of me that knew how to achieve so much that I wanted to change their opinion and that was the achiever state, right? That like this achiever part of me can shift their opinion. But the real shift for me happened when I had to release control by having something happen that was too far out of my control because that I can't achieve my way out of. 
So I just said to Louis Anderson, I want to get over what people think about me. And I go to my hotel room to leave. And there's a car that's going to take me. And I just check my email. And this, this guy writes me and he goes, hey, you con man. He goes, I read this blog that this comic wrote about you. And I click the link. And there's this blog that this guy wrote about me who didn't see me, who didn't know what I was doing. And just spelled out how I must be scamming people. I wasn't even making money doing it. That I must be, you know, had all these bad intentions. And it went viral among the comics. Oh, wow. So they're passing it around. And there were a lot of headliner comics were supportive of it. it. And then it seems like there's a lot of like infighting and anger between comics. Yes, okay. there is. And, uh, it's one of many reasons why, even though I loved stand-up comedy, I'm I'm enjoying not being there anymore. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 you have to have a certain amount of armor. At least this is my perspective on it to be a, a comic, right? Because you, you're dealing with hecklers, yeah. you're dealing with criticism from just you know regular people and from other comics. Mm -hmm. What do you do around like what? Actually, this is what I'm asking. What is your inner sensation and inner dialogue? when you're facing a critic like that. So what do you feel and what does your voice tell you? Well, it's different now than okay. it was then. Well, tell me your enlightened version and your unenlightened. Sure. So now if someone says something, I know for a fact that everything they feel is it's triggering them. It's all about them, right? <laughs> wall to wall. There's literally no, there's no way that I could be what somebody thinks about me because one person could have a bad opinion in the room and one person could have a good opinion in the room. So what do I just become? Oh, I'm I'm really great when I'm with this person. I'm really you have to split your personality for right. every person in the room. Yeah, and and that's the illusion we're in is that what we don't realize is when you think of someone judging you, there's a that person outside of you. And there's an avatar of them inside your mind. So you're not even upset with them. You're, you're mad at a part of them that's inside of you that isn't them. <laughs> so like if you're triggered by someone, let's say someone's triggered by Trump or what, oh, I hate Trump, whatever. Okay, you, Trump's not in the room, but you're mad right now. Like you're sitting here angry at something that exists in your mind. So you're actually at war with yourself under the guise of it's this other person. And so... What I understand now from doing so much work and meditating everything is I've learned how to love all the little avatars and that I'm creating them. And then there can be a separate person with their opinion. And that's none of my business because that's their trigger on their shit. And I don't mean it like, so I'm going to be a dick to everybody or something. But I mean it because that wouldn't be in alignment with my heart. It's That's just healthy boundaries. Like, okay, that that's your stuff, not mine. And, and okay. But you're on stage. So one of my superpowers uh, that I, I have chosen not to practice is I am a world-class troll. I, I've been wired like this since I was a little kid. I know exactly what, button, what buttons to push to make someone just lose their shit. Uh, and I used to take great pleasure in, in mirth in doing that. And I realized I could do it, but it never, you get that little egoic power thing, like, ha ha, look what I did. You know, I'm the puppet master. Uh, but it doesn't actually feel good in my heart. And I just don't do that anymore because it's not nice. And I could do it in writing. I could do it. But let's say last night at your set, uh, I could have heckled the shit out of you if I wanted to. I mean, like I would have been a world-class heckler. I mean, you probably would have known how to handle me because you have more practice than I do. But what would go through your mind now on stage so that you can bring the response to a heckler that usually has some darkness? I mean, you, you're going to take me out, right? How do you do that? I don't take anyone okay. out, but I, I roll with it like a okay. keto, right? Like, in other words, if you watch, there's five different videos of me with hecklers mm -hmm. online right now. And one of them's me with five hecklers. Okay. Like, oh, five at a time. Yeah. And, I, and it becomes part of the show. And I believe that's the same in life. Every single thing that feels off is just a trigger to your expectations versus the moment. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So if you had said something last night, that would have been an improv moment. In fact, it right. probably would have even helped me find the pocket quicker. <laughs> but, uh, but in dialogue, one of the reasons we stress is something, nothing can break your heart. I have a belief that no one can break your heart, but they can break your expectations. Okay. And by breaking your expectations, they can get you closer to your heart. Now, I went on stage with no expectations. 
which created a space for the show to unfold. After a while, it got really crazy. They started making fun of Butter and me. I, I was I was actually laughing myself. <laughs> I'm just being playful. I was, <laughs> was like, good. My mind was like, oh well, Dave's here. Everyone knows him. Because <laughs> well, there was a funny moment where I sat next to you, and the first thing I heard you say was, "You were talking to someone else," and you said. You said something like, yeah, putting butter on steak, that that's the first thing. I, it was funny to hear. <laughs> it'd be like to hear Dave Asprey have the first thing I overhear is put butter on steak. Like it couldn't be more of like. It was in character. <laughs> right. It'd be like you hear you sit next to Michael Jackson and he's singing Billie Jean. Right. Like, oh, wow. Like, that's exactly how I thought he'd be. But one of the things that that I know is that people can only piss you off if they're breaking your expectations. And that's a big opportunity. So you expect hecklers and you don't get pissed. Well, more, I just am in the moment and the show will unfold. Oh, okay. Right? So, so when you get road rage, for instance, you're mad because you thought you were going to be at the place on time and this person's cutting you off. But if you're in a good mood and you're fine with it, then that person cuts you off and you could just be like, neat, I don't care. And that's not, I don't have to be, because you're under the illusion that getting to the place has to happen or else I'm nothing or whatever. And life really isn't that big of a deal. It's fine if they don't like you. It's fine if the business fails. It's fine if you don't make the meeting on time. And when you, the more you relax about things, the more innovation can show up in you because you're not full of all these have tos. So you create a major space of opening for really high level ideas, possibilities that'll transcend the story of who you thought you were. Really amazing creative things. So one of the things I'm working on always, and I'm not a master at, but it's getting better and better, is living in the moment. We did the Dolby Theater that you saw that that trailer of. Yeah, you sold out the entire theater, like 3,400 people. 3,400 people. That's And the whole amazing. show was two days, not one word was planned. I didn't realize that was a two day show. So that's like a, a Tony Robbins level kind of a thing. It was there. a two day, yeah. But nothing's planned, right? Okay. And because nothing's planned, we had really amazing moments happen where someone did heckle or something, and then we brought them on stage and shifted them. And so you had two days, nothing planned. Nothing planned. It got better and better, too, because yeah. the more you went, the more your creativity was coming through and the less your ego was trying to get it perfect. So by day two, it gets even crazier and, and expands on an exponential level because... By day one, we're all out of our stories of what we should be. And by day two, we're all in our hearts so we can hear what our highest callings are without all the yeah buts showing up. So by the end of day two, everyone is making these decisions from a place that they couldn't see before they started day one. Wow. Yeah. What? I mean, there's a certain amount of risk in that. I, I just put on the the Bulletproof or the, the biohacking conference with Upgrade Labs it was a two and a half day event, Beverly Hilton, best we've done in six years, but it had so much planning. We scripted, you know, every talk, my own talks, I knew the general gist, but I just came up and said, I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. Kind of like you do, right? I, I know it's going to flow, but I also know I want to, I want to share these important things with the audience. But the amount of planning for that was insane. I have a hard time imagining a two day personal development event. You didn't have workbooks, you didn't have exercises planned out, nothing? Because life unfolds. And if Dang. I, if I, life unfolds, like if I had a bunch of plans, now, by the way, I'm not saying don't, if that works for, I mean, if you have no idea what you're doing, a definite step up would be definitely schedule everything and yeah. put those bullet points down. But if you put someone like Robin Williams or Jim Carrey with a note by note thing, or Eckhart Tolle, yeah or Michael Beckwith or Wayne Dyer, yeah. then you put them into a shrinking capacity because they're in a place of wanting to, to blossom. Oh, if you tell them they have to talk through every point, yeah, same, same way. You have to be able to go up down a riff and come back right. and all, okay. But this conversation yep. wasn't scheduled. Like, imagine when you go to dinner with someone, you mm -hmm. flow. You Imagine how weird it'd be if you went to dinner with someone and you had a set list. You're like, so do you have cats? And you're <laughs> reading off a list. You know, here, we're going to ask this. And how much more work would you suddenly have for that dinner. And there's a you that has a heart that that also exists. It's blocked that, by thinking. Right? That that can be so whenever I make a video, if I have a I'm going to make a video about this topic, I'm not nearly as good because my mind like suddenly is trying to put a pin in in this idea and then the flow can't come through because every moment there's new stuff trying to come through. Okay. So if I'm like, okay, it's gonna be about this, then I'm in my head for a second because I'm like, I got to talk about what, what 
we decided versus what wants to come up. Okay. So in this moment, stuff's coming up. And then the moment you're recording or on stage, new stuff's coming up. So when you're on stage, if you have to say this one thing, but you're also thinking uh, like of this other thing you want to talk about, and you're more married to the one thing versus what's trying to come through, that actually is a repression in a way of what you actually are. And the depth of your heart can share, can't share because it's, it's got this rule. Is that making sense? Yeah, uh, it, it is making sense. It, it's, uh, it's definitely a risky way to do it. I mean, you could have had a two day event where people are just tired and you know, you bombed and all that. Did you have those and my, concerns? And, and if that happened, that would be perfect for growth because <laughs> for your growth, but you want to have some <laughs> unhappy people. <laughs> well, we had done enough events this way that we learned you felt comfortable. Yeah. I mean, the, the events that I did, the very first ones, a couple of them, there were some bullet points or ideas of what I should have, yeah. but you're also taking, you know, and I don't want to minimize this. You're also taking me as 20 years on stage as a comic too. Experience matters. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm to the point you can put me on stage with one minute notice and having had no agenda and say, I want you to talk in this general thing and I can do it with no fear and I'm happy and it's probably going to be good. But if I prepped for 20 minutes and thought about an arc, it'd probably be better. But the difference is a five or a 10% thing. Yeah. Are you like that? Or are you like, you don't even have the five or 10% difference. You just walk out there and you just nail it. So I even believe that exists with like, just to add on to what you're saying, I believe that exists with everyone. Cause I've had so many people that you can see on these events where once I get them to just start saying the thing they're feeling mm -hmm. and letting that moment pass where you just say the thing you're feeling, like you just say, whatever, I'm nervous, I'm feeling off, whatever. Then the audience actually sees you so much more, right? And then they know what that feels like. So they go into their hearts because they're feeling when they were nervous. Now you're being real. And then once you feel seen in the nervousness, you actually feel okay. And then you can access a lot of stuff. So I've had many, many people go up on stage that never had stage experience or anything, but we all have experience in talking off the cuff, yeah. right? But we only do it when we're relaxed and most people get so uptight on stage. Right. It sounds like you never had stage fright other than that well, time that's, when you developed it in the middle of your career. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, that, I had horrible stage fright at that point, but but yeah, the stage is more comfortable to me, honestly. There, that's what Elton John's song Rocket Man is about. Yeah. Like, do you know that? Space is the stage. Mm. Because it's like, you can't have kids here. You know, Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. And But there's something about the stage for me that I'm I'm more comfortable on. Yeah, I, I feel you there. I, I'm exceedingly happy when I get a chance to share something that matters. Yeah. Uh, and I feel very comfortable as well. Um, I'm just, I'm going through my own inner emotions. Like I was, I was wondering what I'd feel. I did Tony's stage, you know, 15,000 people. And they said, oh, we're going to play your intro video. Uh, Cause I have this little video that like says, Hey, welcome Dave. And has, you know, my story. So I don't have to tell it every time. Mm -hmm. And they didn't play it. And they're like, Oh, hey, welcome Dave. And, and I was like, I wonder what I'll feel. And I, just, I walked out there and I was just I didn't, I don't think my heart rate variability changed. I think my heart rate changed. I was just like happy. And I was sort of thinking you go out there and you know, there's, you, you know what it's like, at the, like the Dolby theater, but you know, there's people up high and down low. And, but I didn't, I didn't experience a blip at all and, and was sort of wondering, okay, I didn't, I wasn't expecting to, but I was just curious about it. Is there an environment for you that'd be like, oh shit. Like if you're in front of a hundred thousand people, you're at like Wembley stadium or something where you'd be like, all right, this is, this is a little bit much, but like, I'm, I'm going to go do it. Or are you just done with your stage friend? This is a really corny answer, but it really depends on how much I meditated that day. Okay. No, that's a, that's a truthful answer. Yeah. Right? Okay. Because the factor that if, so if, so my answer would be, let's say I was about to do whatever, something with Oprah or a hundred thousand people or the shows on Obama's lap. I don't know what that, like, it's just something <laughs> that we perceive as big. So the illusion that I'm under, this is where it gets crazy, is that something outside of me is bigger than what I am. But really the only thing I'm battling, even if it's, I'm performing for a hundred thousand people are my thoughts and my thoughts of the hundred thousand people are what I'm in the argument with. 
And, and the only reason we get nervous is not because of the circumstance, but because the belief that the circumstance is bigger than the story of what you believe you are. Like that actually comes back down to I'm someone who doesn't perform for 20,000 people, the same as I'm someone who makes $20,000 a year. Someone offers you a million dollars. That's death to the story of what you are. Okay. So I hope, I hope I'm not going too crazy and deep here, but like if I was to think, oh, I'm going to do this high pressure gig. If I do well, it brings in whatever, $10 million, whatever. If I feel nerves, then I'm under the illusion that my thought about it is bigger than me, but I'm still creating those thoughts. So if I close my eyes and I listen with my heart, it goes back to the moment and it feels a love for those thoughts and then they go away. Like when you love the thoughts that yeah. are coming up, they can't exist. It, it's a form of, of self-love. Where in your mind do you draw the line between uh, compassion and love? Like, like when I look at how I turn off, if I have a feeling like that, there's a, a sensation, like a, a skill that I learned doing maybe a little bit of heart rate variability, but it's mostly from neurofeedback. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a gratitude forgiveness thing, but it, it's, it's a muscle in the middle of my chest that I can, I can feel. So I immediately just throw that switch and then the thing goes away. But I would identify that more, maybe more as compassion do you, do you have a line there? Yeah, let me rephrase love then so it's okay. clear. I don't mean like fall in love with it. I mean like um, acceptance of it. Okay. So what I think our habit is, let's say you feel off. Usually we go into this darkness for a second that we don't even know. Right when we hit that darkness, we often get into our head to go to a fixer of that mm -hmm. darkness. So whenever we're in our head strategizing, I find it's quite a bit because we're scared of the pain that's trying to show up in our body. Right. So let's say you find out someone's talking shit about you, for instance, that you think is really important and I'm saying it matters. Let's say that shows up yep. in your body. OK, so you feel off for a second and you immediately go, you call them to fix it. Right. You whatever you you ask them to forgive you. You talk to them, whatever. There's a fixer that kicks in. The fixer is not fixing that. It's kicking in so that you don't have to feel this pain that's trying to show up. Okay. Now, if you let the pain just be there, that I believe is an access point to a deeper, more creative, flowing, more powerful you. But you have to love it. Like you're drilling into oil. You're about to hit oil, mm -hmm. but you're instead fixing to stay a little more shallow than hitting oil. So when you feel off, when people listening, you're feeling off, what I have, I have a thousand videos online that people mm -hmm. can see on our Dolby event, on the Absolutely Everything Pass, we have a million events where you, sh you see me get to someone and I go, tell me what you feel. And I go, I feel scared. And usually they try to analyze their way out of it. I feel scared, but it's fine because later I blow. No, just say you feel scared. And they're stuck with this lump in their chest. It's hard to say, right? Right? Yeah. And so I go, just, you feel scared. And they go, yeah. And I go, okay. What's it feel like? And they go, it feels like a lump. And I go, okay, here's what that is. This is what this is right here. That lump that you feel that's coming up is a childhood you that has <laughs> felt that it hasn't been allowed to feel the way it feels yeah. because your parents were not conscious enough to give you enough acceptance to be seen in that way. And, and see, a certain number of people listening, especially people who have a computer science background like me or something, uh, are probably going, that is such utter bullshit. But That's I, fine. I, I will tell you, this is how the body works. Yes. Like you can see it with electrodes. Uh, and I, I remember I was about 30 and I went to my first real personal development event. And the the people who are working with me who are really good, they're like, so uh, what are you, you're not feeling your emotions, Dave. And I'm like, bullshit, I'm not feeling my emotions. I'm feeling pissed off and angry and we all use all this stupid crap here, <laughs> you know? And, and they said, well, there's something in there besides anger. I'm like, there's nothing. And after a day of this, I'm like the only person who's not feeling anything, but just like yeah. a little bit of disrespect. Then finally, um, her name is Barbara. She looks at me and she goes, do you feel something in your body? I go, yeah, there's something in my stomach that's different. She goes, yeah, there's a name for that. I'm like, what is it? She said, it's fear. And I'm like, seriously? And then this was the thing that for me was the unlocker. Uh, I said, but there's nothing here for me to be afraid of. Therefore, it's not fear. And she just laughed. And, and she's like, do you think fear is rational? Like, it doesn't matter if there's something. Like, like it's just happening. And I was, I was sort of going, I guess it's not a rational thing because it's an emotion. And then I realized, okay, there must be stuff going on in my body. And I have no idea what it is. And I started paying attention. And that was sort of the thing that opened the door for me to start 
you know, working on all that stuff and identifying it, but your comment about it being something you weren't allowed to feel or some sort of childhood trauma, it, it's that way all the time. Yes. And you know something that I find who has the hardest time feeling those feelings? Comedians. Are, are people, well, no, <laughs> they, they kind of do, but people who achieve a lot. Oh, yeah. Because CEOs, you know, we know that it's hard to come from a hard background, but it's also hard to come from an abundant background because you've had so much. It's like if you live in a cage, but we keep throwing candy in the cage, you're never going to want to leave the cage. Yeah. So when you can, you know, talk your way out of it, you know, money your way out of it, drink your way out of it, party your way out of it, it's still going to be there. And what I believe is in the moment, we have this crazy opportunity. This sounds so corny to people, and I promise you, this actually ties with having a much more successful career. Because we're at a consciousness now where just achieving something isn't enough. There's enough millionaires that have been depressed and suicidal that that it turns out that's not the ultimate form of happiness. And there are so many millionaires that end up going eventually to Buddhist monks to learn. Oh, yeah. But the reverse never happens. There's not a lot of Buddhist monks going, how do I get the Lamborghini? <laughs> and if you and really... And the ones who do aren't very good Buddhist monks. <laughs> right, exactly. Because the highest form of... Co- the highest uh, asset we have is connecting to this moment. And believe it or not, when you do, you actually become a much bigger space to be able to receive much bigger abundance. Like if you want a lot of money, instead of chasing money, connect to a vibration yeah. that's higher than money. Yeah, it, if money's your focus, it'll always move out of the grass. That, that was right. pretty much the story of my 30s. Um, or even getting the person or yeah. the career or the, yeah. you know. It's the acceptance thing you're talking about. Yeah. And so, so you went through a, a pretty dramatic path to do it. But underlying all these fears mm-hmm. is is something, at least if if I look at what I learned in Tibet and all, it's ultimately a fear of death. Because yes. oh, if I'm not accepted, then I'll be kicked out of the tribe and a lion will eat me or whatever weird genetic Isn't programming that we, we have. Like we link a fear of death to if I don't make enough money. We link yeah. a fear of death to um, if she talks crap about me. We make a fear of death to, yeah. I mean, everything. If the, it, like that thought of, do you get nervous at 100,000 people? Because we associate, if I have a bad set in front of 100,000 people, that I'll die. Yeah, and it's, it's not real, but it feels that way. And that's why I believe if you want to be successful, fall in love with failing. Like, I mean, really want to fail. Oh, yeah. If you want to have a really good relationship, fall in love with being single. If you want to have a really good life, fall in love with death because it's a part of life. Man, you you read my mind on that because that's the question that is my new question in the show after 600 episodes of asking people about you know, three pieces of advice to perform better that became the the survey data for Game Changers, mm-hmm. my, my last book. The new question to support the next book that comes out in September on anti-aging is how long do you want to live? Oh man, whatever it wants. Okay. Like I, that's a, like for me, I find the less expectation I have, first of all, the more I'm going to live. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I don't, that's fine too. I live fully up until it. Okay. So you want to live fully. So if you could live fully for another hundred years, would you? Yeah. 200 years. Yeah, if it's if it's if it's full, because I think that a lot of us spend a lot of our life trying to protect a life that we're not living. Yeah. You know, we're getting all the locks on the doors and all the stuff and protecting ourselves. But then we sit inside and watch Jerry Springer and aren't living unless that is living to them. But for me, I I would love to live fully. And I but I but I undo myself from the expectation because I more want to live now. Yeah, I, I think that's really healthy. I've been super public. I'm in self just to think about it. Like, I'm going to live to at least 180. Yeah. Right. But there's two things going on there. One is at least. So I'm not creating a ceiling or, or mm-hmm. even uh, even expectation. I think it's reasonable. But there's a little asterisk that the reporters usually don't write about, which is actually I just would prefer to die at a time and by a method of my own choice. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) if I believe, tell me if you agree with this, I I wonder if at least, if we were born into a world with exactly these bodies, but everyone around us lived to 500 years old, Mm -hmm. and from the very beginning, we believed and saw it all the way as normal to live up to 500. Mm -hmm. Like when I say right now to most people listening, oh, picture yourself at 90 years old, 
people immediately make themselves have gray hair, wrinkles. Oh, yeah, they're wrecked. Right. So there's an un deep subconscious belief system of expectation that when we hit 100, we're going to be dead or, or old and wrinkled, right? If, but if you were just constantly from birth in a world where every person around you lived to 500, but you still had your exact body, I wonder if our subconscious would all the way believe that was normal. And we would also just expect that, believe that, and move in a way where we'd at least age way past 72 yeah. or whatever. I fundamentally believe that. Yeah. And I did an interview with a guy named John Medina from University of Washington a while back. Mm. And he did this study or he talked about a study where they would take people who are say 80 and you know, people who are older and they would set up a hotel with all of the stuff from when they were 20, like all the, the antiques stuff on the TV playing stuff when they were 20. So it looked and felt exactly like that. And they looked at physiological markers of aging and cognitive performance. These people got younger, like they time traveled. Yeah. And that's an example of reversing something versus just, oh yeah, we don't get old. And the the big mission for me around anti-aging is I actually know that we can extend human life. Uh, we, I, I know the people doing the work, I'm doing the work myself. Um, I, I would say we're already making achievements there. For some people, if you're willing to make changes. Well, one thing just to mention on that, for the people that go bullshit. Yeah. I just want to offer them to notice where that pattern comes from because the only evidence that you say bullshit from is from your past. Yeah. And the more you're in the moment, the more you clear out the past to make it much easier to stay young. So just as an add-on. Oh, I love that. And, and it, it's that picture of the future because we always, uh, in fact, Alberto Viotto, um, a good friend who's a, a shaman and cultural anthropologist who's been on the show as well. Um, he, he says, we, we dream the future into being. And... I think the future of being old is the, the village elder, right? where we actually have this idea that, you know what, this is a person who has more arrows in their back than I do. They know where the best game is to be found. They've made the mistakes. They've loved, they've lost, uh, they've survived. They can probably, if I'm just willing to listen, offer me incredible wisdom that will reduce pain and struggle for me and, and just kind of illuminate a path. Otherwise I have to go discover it all for myself. Yeah. Uh, and so if you have enough energy and your brain still works when you're old, you, you, like now I have the knowledge to give back. You're like, I'm going to give back when I'm 20. That's awesome because it feels really good to give back, but you don't have the knowledge. You have the energy, but not the wisdom. So I, I'm like age and wisdom are real. And yes. there's a shortage of that right now. Yes. And that's one of the things that motivates anti-aging. And when you say live fully, you're saying so you don't want to have that vision of, you know, tubes and wheelchairs and monitors and hospitals and pain and surgery, and which is what most people think of, right? What does it look like when you're old though in your mind? I also mean by live fully, those little moments where you feel the calling. What if we left this? What if we, you know, move forward? What if we ask that person out? What if we, those things that have a feeling that expand your body. In fact, can I tell you a story of oh, yeah, how yeah. I, it was what I experienced in my body not related to the the raw vegan, but what I experienced psychologically about changing everything that I was that opened a door to so many things. So check this out. So this story will hopefully open your hearts and also maybe change careers here <laughs> because it's kind of crazy. But at one point in 2011, I decided that I wanted to go raw vegan for 90 days. And to make sure that I did it, I announced to my following that I'm going to give away $10,000 if I eat anything cooked or meat oriented as a way to force myself to stay in the 90 days. It was my, as Tony Robbins would say, get on the island and burn the boats. So I go 30 days first. And I noticed that no matter what you feel about the diet, I noticed that my taste buds changed. They adapted to yeah. it. My cells changed. Someone walked by me with a hot dog and all I smelled was chemicals and metal, right? So I kept going. And then I started thinking all of a sudden, the way that I was eating before no matter what it is, the way that I was eating before has a heaviness to it. It feels different. So I started asking myself, what else in my life feels vibrationally heavy? So I said, Facebook. Now, even though I need Facebook for social marketing and all that stuff, I felt like it still felt heavy. So I decided to not do Facebook for a while. And when you let go of something, the only reason you're stressed is your mind can measure what you will lose and it can't see what you'll gain. So now all of a sudden, 
I'm not spending all day on Facebook and I'm just alone with my creativity. And my meter of what is heavy got much louder and much higher. So I said, for a while, I, I don't want to date. I don't want to date anyone. It's distracting. And that was a really tough day. Um, I'm just kidding. It was for a while. But so then <laughs> <clears throat> with that meter higher and higher, at the height of my comedy career, we were filming a documentary and I looked into the camera and I felt me doing comedy clubs, even though it was my dream at one point, is not the highest me. So I announced into the camera, I'm officially done doing comedy clubs on the road. And I had no idea what was on the other side, but my body felt this would expand me. I don't know what I'll do, but I can feel in my body it feels right. We'll find out. We're going to let go of the story of who you are as a comic. So the next week, I'm home alone when I would have been on the road making whatever five to seven grand to headline a comedy club for a week. And my, my alignment with myself was so high that I became someone who now no longer even needs comedy clubs, dating, Facebook, or all these things. Like I felt like I'm in an alignment that's even higher. It felt like this Gandhi, Martin Luther King power place, right? Where it was really cool. And in that vibration, I thought to myself, what if I combine comedy and transformation? And I remember my ego going quietly, well, no one's ever done that the way that you want to do it. And my body went, no one's ever done that. And I was like, what if I do all these comedy clubs or, or do comedy, but transform things the way that I want to do it? So the next week, I got a cameraman to come to my house and I made 500 videos for the bookers of the colleges that I had performed at by name wow. and told them I want to do the lecture circuit and do comedy meets transformation. And that week I could have been headlining a comedy club and making another seven grand or whatever. And my friends were going, what are you doing? This is crazy. And then a hundred of them said yes. Wow. So that's how you did it. And, and, and that was the start. So a hundred of them said yes at a much higher rate right? And all of a sudden I was making way more money. And instead of going out and doing a comedy club for a week, which my mind could have said, well, you should be doing that. That's your dream. I went to a consciousness that found a higher level thing. And I combined comedy and transformation, went out, did one college, came back, right? One college came back, made way more money and said what I actually feel. Then I had this agency that was one of the biggest agencies in the world that wanted me to stay a comic. I think what I was doing was a threat to them or they were like, what are you doing? But they were also taking 10% of all these college gigs. And I had in my body that even though they were one of the biggest agencies in the world, they were feeling heavy to me. So I had this thing in my body that goes, you got to let go of them. Wow. And, I, and my mind could justify why I would keep them because they were getting me auditions for movies and all this stuff, right? But I felt in my body, but they feel heavy. They want to take 10% of stuff you are doing, they aren't doing. So I called them and I dropped them and they were shocked. They were like, no one's dropped us. And I'm like, <laughs> I know it doesn't make sense. It's a spiritual thing for me. Let me just do this. I let go of them. And a week later, and no part of me is saying this is because of this, but it sure was weird. They announced that Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle have combined forces, which is weird because I'm told that I'm what would happen if those two had a baby. <laughs> and they're the most opposing energies in the world. They really are pretty different. Yeah. Yeah. So they created this event called Gate and the people there asked me to perform at it. That's so cool. And because I wasn't bringing the energy of hoping I keep the agent and keeping everyone happy and dating and all those things, I went into that room and I felt so confident and I had an off-the-cuff set that was so crazy. I looked in the audience. There's Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle. They're sitting next to each other. And I said, this is really weird because I'm told I'm what would happen if Jim Carrey and Eckhart Tolle had a baby. <laughs> and then I said, I don't know if you're picturing that. Eckhart, I know you're not because it's a thought and I know you don't have those. And then I said, some of you guys might think that joke's offensive, but it's in the past. So Eckhart doesn't even know about it. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the place went crazy. And a bunch of people in the theater were producers and they offered me parts and movies meaning without your 10 percent, without without the auditions wow like i was scared to lose the agency because i would not be able to audition for movies and then when i let go of auditioning all of a sudden the movies were coming to me so often we hold on to a thing that we think that we need to get the thing and that's actually the thing blocking you from the thing that is such a cool story. Isn't that crazy? So that's why I learned when you let go of something, your job is to follow the highest calling. And that's how you live fully. It's like skydiving every day and going to a new channel of consciousness. 
that you can't see or understand, but then life mirrors that. Ah, oh, okay. Beautiful. Kyle, we didn't mention the name of your book. What was your book called? Yes. So the book is called, and it's called The Illusion of Money, Why Chasing Money is Stopping You from Receiving It. Now, you showed me the cover of your book last night, and, and I thought for a minute I was looking at, at the Tony Robbins uh, book on I money. I didn't know that until you said that. <laughs> I, was, weren't thinking I was totally laughing. It has that same vibe, like when you look at the cover. But I, <laughs> and his I, is called Money, and mine's called The Illusion of Money, <laughs> which is totally not the intent. But, but I do believe there's a, 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 a time where we believe to make money, your job is to achieve and chase it. Right. But... What we don't see is how much more is trying to come to us if we'd learn how to change channels and learn how to receive a higher level of it. Beautiful. Kyle, I've had a fantastic time getting so to know you uh, last night and just getting a chance to chat with you and share your evolution and wisdom with Listen on Bulletproof Radio. Thanks for being here. I'm guessing Instagram, probably. Where do people follow you? They can like follow that? me. So you can definitely go to kylecease.com. My Facebook's bigger than my Instagram. Uh, but I would say one of the things we have is called the absolutely everything pass, which is like our Netflix of all my content. Okay. But I also do weekly live calls and I answer people and I have different special guests on. We had Christian Northrup on a couple cool. of weeks ago and, um, I'd love to have you on sometime. Oh, actually. that sounds like fun. Sure. Yeah. And we answer their crowdcast calls and you can pull them up and we actually answer the people one-on-one. -on -one. Oh, nice. But it's basically all the content that I used to sell for thousands of dollars that we just make as a, a monthly $29 a month okay. that they can have it. And it's honestly like investing in your soul. It's the best thing you can do. And then the book we're so excited about, I'm telling you, it will transform so many things and pay for itself over and over and over again. It's a vibrational difference versus just an effort difference. Okay. KyleSees.com. That's K-Y-L-E-C-E-A-S-E. -E. Correct. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you, Dave. I had so much fun with you. If you liked today's episode, you know what to do. Uh, go out there and stop believing whatever kind of BS is going on inside your head because it's probably wrong, at least if you believe Kyle. And he's right. Have an awesome day. <laughs>